I think it's about time we stop those of us who support, as most of us do, Israel in this body, for apologizing for our support for Israel. There's no apology to be made, none. It is the best $3 billion investment we make. Were there not an Israel, the United States of America would have to invent an Israel to protect her interest in the region. The United States would have to go out and invent an Israel. I get, I think, righteously angry when people lie about America, when people lie about our history, when I'm going to hear people lie about the, the supposed apartheid in Israel. What are you talking about? This is, a, this is like a little America in the Middle East around a sea of tyranny. And I believe that America has a moral obligation to continue to support Israel in its quest to protect its holy land, its people, and its ability to defend itself. 7th of October didn't start on 7th of October. It started on 1948 on the 15th of May. It started by the Nakba for the Palestinians. This happened when they want to cover up their killings, the genocide, with more genocide, with more killings. The state of Israel is a rebellion against God, and they will not succeed. They will come to an end. A person who can justify genocide, a person who can commit genocide, I can't count him as a Jew. People who justify genocide, there are more Nazis than Jews. When people think of fascist regimes such as Nazi Germany or the Zionist entity that exists today in occupied Palestine, people often think that these are outliers of the democratic values of the West. However, nothing could be further from the truth. Fascism is capitalism in decay and is a vicious response by the ruling classes to that decay. In fact, it is the horrific dictatorship of finance capital which must consume its scapegoats quickly in order to survive until it eventually burns out. The term fascism comes from the Italian word fascio, meaning bundle of sticks. Its inherent meaning is that it is the unity of political and economic powers against a common enemy. What the common enemy is, however, is often invented, hence the scapegoating aspect of fascism. Every society under fascism needs scapegoats in order to maintain itself, so that the proletariat are distracted from aiming their grievances at the ruling class for causing the conditions under which they suffer. Many scapegoats include those of a different race, the LGBT community, NGOs, so-called globalists, among many others. Fascism at its core has always embodied a single, monolithic and unequivocal conceptualization of a racial and or national identity that intentionally sidesteps the ultimate contradiction in modern capitalist society, the contradiction between capital and labour. Because of this, all forms of fascism are class collaborationist in character, that is, where class struggle is denied in order to facilitate the idea of a single race or nation having the right to exist with full rights and self-determination which is ultimately beneficial to the bourgeoisie. This forms part of the scapegoating aspect of fascism. In the words of Seamus Costello, when speaking about people who come from the loyalist tradition in the North, which exerts supremacy over the Catholic population, never are they told that the jobs which they hold and the houses which they live in are theirs by right. Rather, they are tricked into believing that these natural rights are a reward for the support of the regime. These tactics serve the twofold purpose of keeping a large section of the population loyal to the regime, whilst at the same time it ensures that they do not insist on a bigger share in the wealth. Therefore, as another form of fascism, Zionism is also class collaborationist, in that the contradiction between the bourgeoisie and the proletariat among the Zionist population in the Zionist settler colonial entity are next to non-existent. As all contradictions between capital and labour are superfluous, the main priority is the continued existence of the Zionist entity, which is always struggling against the natural contradictions it faces as a settler colony against the indigenous population. Even the trade union movement within the Zionist state is inherently based on the existence of the Zionist entity, 
as Zionist workers occupied the position of labour aristocracy, this has been seen in other settler colonies, such as the north of Ireland, for example, where religious sectarianism created labour aristocracies, where Protestant workers enjoyed more beneficial treatment from employers than Catholic workers. Most notably, the shipyard workers at Harland and Wolf Shipyard, which employed only 225 Catholics out of its 3,000 employees in 1886. Emboldened by this comfortable situation, whenever inevitable tensions arose, there were many occasions where such workers would violently drive Catholic workers out of the workplace. A similar situation has been happening in Palestine, where Palestinian workers are subject to horrific conditions despite fulfilling a gap in labour for the Zionist entity on their homeland, which is currently being filled by Indian workers as part of a deal between Netanyahu and the Indian state. Since the Al-Aqsa campaign in October 2023 and the genocide which followed, Zionism needs to adopt fascistic methods to suppress any opposition to it, whether opponents are Jewish or Palestinian or any other nationality. This suppression is even more harsh and draconian if opposition is voiced by Palestinians, the scapegoat or the focus of the colonizer in this context. Israel not only hones in and develops such fascistic methods, but spreads them around the world, particularly within the imperial core and countries being controlled by it. This is in terms of investment and supplying of hardware to strengthen the military and police apparatus of those countries. This is all in order to suppress the proletariat in those countries and the potential for uprising. In this video, we will be looking at how this plays out around the world, including Ireland. Before we continue with the video, my laptop is running quite slow at the moment. So if you want to help get these videos out faster, please consider checking out my Patreon in the link below or my Ko-fi to give a one-time donation. You'll also get a shout out at the end of the next video. With that being said, let's get straight into it. As Red Army General Marshal Zhukov famously said, we liberated Europe from fascism, but they will never forgive us for it. However, since the beginning of the war, the New York Times was writing pro-Hitler articles minimizing his ardent anti-Semitism, saying that it was only populist rhetoric. They also made him out to be this great leader who would bring calm and stability to Germany and Europe. In return, Hitler loved the US and its racist Jim Crow eugenics laws and ordered Nazi lawyers and judges to study and copy it, only for them to realise that it was too much even for them. In Mein Kampf, Hitler praised American Jim Crow laws, and after the Nazis came to power, they intensively studied the US legal model for inspiration. When they reviewed the one-drop rule, they considered it to be too harsh. The Nazis also took great inspiration from the genocide of Native Americans and its enshrining in US law and legitimization in the ideology of Manifest Destiny. The US was also the first to use Zyklon B gas to gas immigrants on the US-Mexico border, which the Nazis picked up on. Between 1942 and 1945, the company named IG Farben in Germany manufactured this cyanide-based pesticide for use mostly against the Jews in the gas chambers of Europe. The use of this gas, as well as other substances by the US, is what led to the infamous bath riots in 1917, where a Mexican maid, Carmelita Torres, refused to take the gasoline bath that was a requirement for crossing the border. The practice would continue, however, until the 1950s. The US did not just provide the legal framework, but also material assistance through major US companies such as IBM and Ford, as well as General Motors. And as we all know, Henry Ford was a notorious anti-Semite. This occurred not only after the Nazis took power, but even after the US entered the war. Because Germany had many restrictions imposed upon it in terms of militarization at the end of World War I, it could not arm its military again without the reliance upon American companies. John D. Rockefeller Standard Oil financed the construction of the world's largest oil refinery in Germany. The American company General Electric also owned German engineering companies and the General Motors company owned the German company Opel. The relationship between General Motors and Opel is particularly important important. DuPont, who controls General Motors, did not hide his sympathies for the Nazis, 
and openly financed Hitler's Nazi party, as well as similar political structures in the US. In the 1930s, Opel factories in Germany produced engines, among other things, related to automotion for the German army. Contacts between American business circles and the elite of the Third Reich were also integrated at a very high level. Many high-ranking figures in the Nazi party and German leadership were very friendly with American financiers and industrialists. American financiers liked the idea of a change of power and the subsequent fight against Bolshevism and the USSR. This is echoed in international relations between the Soviet Union and Western countries just prior to World War II, and is expanded upon by Michael Parenti in this clip. On the eve of World War II, foreign minister of the Soviet Union named Litinov, Litinov, Litinov went to, did I pronounce his name correctly? No, I can't say it that way. <laughs> went to the Western powers and called for an alliance with England, the United States, and France against Nazi Germany. And that if the Germans attacked Czechoslovakia, they would all join in or attack Poland or attack anybody, that all the powers would join in at, to fight Hitler and contain him. The Western allies refused those overtures from the Soviet Union. Not because they were appeasers, not because they were simple and naive, quite the contrary, because they had a plan of their own. And that plan was Munich. And the plan was we give Hitler Czechoslovakia and he goes east. And they were waiting for a war. And that war was supposed to come. And it was going to be Nazi Germany finishing off Bolshevik Russia. Just as they had sent armies in against Russia just a few years less than a decade before. So they now plan to do the same. And so they've done again and again. And that war was fought. fought and most of it was fought on the Eastern Front. Seven out of every ten German soldiers who died in that war died on the Eastern Front. The, the scale of fighting was enormous. The battles of Kurtz, Stalingrad, the Battle of Berlin. There's nothing like it that happened in the Western theater. In 1941, this connection between the U.S. and the Nazis continued long into the 20th and 21st century, right up to the present day, only in the shadows. NATO, for example, has absorbed many high-profile Nazis into its organisation. Those who view the channel regularly may remember Adolf Husinger from the Should Ireland Join NATO video, who helped plan invasions of Poland and France as the chief of staff for the Nazis. NATO appointed him chairman of the NATO Military Committee in 1961. He was also awarded a medal called the U.S. Legion of Merit by the United States. Johann von Kiemenseg, who was General Staff Officer to the Nazi Army's High Command, was made Commander-in-Chief of the Allied Forces in Central Europe by NATO in 1967. Ernst Feber, who was a Major in the Nazi Army and the Group Leader of the Nazi Army Supreme Command Organizational Department, he was made Commander-in-Chief of Allied Forces in Central Europe by NATO in 1973. Johann Steinhoff, who was a fighter pilot for the Wehrmacht in World War II. He was made chairman of the NATO Military Committee in 1971. Karl Schnell, who was a general staff officer for the Nazis in World War II, was made commander-in-chief of Allied forces in Central Europe by NATO in 1975. Franz Josef Schulze, who received military honours from Hitler himself during World War II, was made commander-in-chief of Allied forces in Central Europe by NATO in 1977. Ferdinand von Senger, und Etterlin was a tank commander for the Nazis during World War II. He also was made commander-in-chief of Allied forces in Central Europe by NATO in 1979. So, as you may be able to deduct from all of this information, the Nazis and the US had a cosy relationship that continued well into the 20th century and beyond, dispelling the myth that the Nazis were beaten in World War II by the US and not the Soviets, and that the Nazis just went went into the dustbin of history. Nothing could be further from the truth. However, you may also be asking, where did the Zionists fit into all of this? Well, to answer this question, we'll have to take a step back to the pre-war era in the 1930s. If you want to see a little bit more about the early history of Zionism, I touch upon that in my previous video, Why Does Ireland Stand With Palestine? Because a lot of the characters who were involved in propagating the Zionist project were also involved in the oppression of the Irish people people around the same time. Make sure you check that out after you've finished watching this video. Link will be in the description. 
Coming back to the early links between Zionism and Nazism, on the 25th of August 1933, the Zionists and Nazi Germany signed a deal called the Havara Agreement. This was the result of negotiations between the Zionist Federation of Germany, the Anglo-Palestine Bank, under the directive of the Jewish Agency, and the economic authorities of Nazi Germany. This deal was meant to facilitate the emigration of German Jews to Palestine. As they left Germany, they were forced to give up possessions to Germany temporarily before departing. These would later be reobtained by the Jews by transferring them to Palestine as German export goods. This arrangement was of course only limited to those in the Jewish community in Germany who had the wealth to give to the Nazis in order to guarantee their safe passage. Again pointing to the class collaborationist aspect of fascism that was discussed earlier in the video. And judging by this commemorative coin for the Havara Agreement, you could deduct that Zionism and Nazism are two sides of the same coin. Unfunny dad jokes aside, in the next section of this video we will see how this fascism has spread all around the world, facilitated by the US and the Western imperialist core. The Israeli state has helped provide material assistance to reactionary and suppressive regimes all around the world, particularly South America, which is what we will begin with. Nicaragua, which had been ran by the Somoza dictatorship as a neo-colonial puppet state for the US, was undergoing a general uprising of the Sandinista-led population who had had enough of the family's dynasty which had ruled and monopolised the country for half a century. The Israeli state, as well as the US, had been supplying Somoza with weapons for all of this time. However, when President Jimmy Carter came into office in 1976, he ordered the cessation of all US military military assistance to Nicaragua. Israel took advantage of Carter's human rights policy by filling this gap. In order to fill this void, the Israeli state immediately increased its weapon supplies to Samosa until he fled the country when the Sandinistas eventually took power. Israeli operatives then helped train reactionary Nicaraguan Contras in Honduran and Costa Rican camps to fight against the Sandinista government, according to Colombian police intelligence reports. Speaking of Colombia, Israel had been involved in running affairs there too. Castao, who had led the Colombian paramilitaries, known by their Spanish acronym AUC, the largest right-wing paramilitary force to ever exist, was trained in the military and war tactics in Israel in the 1980s. Castao himself boasted about his time in Israel, saying that, I copied the concept of paramilitary forces from the Israelis. The AUC paramilitaries originally stemmed from hired thugs whose purpose was to protect drug running operations and large landowners. Castao organised them into a cohesive force in the late 1990s. Still an illegal organisation, it worked alongside the Colombian military in in a similar manner to the relationship of the Lebanese Falange to the Israeli army throughout the 1980s and 1990s, Israeli trainers travelled to Colombia in the late 1980s themselves in order to train the AUC over there. 50 of the paramilitary's best students were subsequently given scholarships to Israel for further training, and the AUC became the most prominent reactionary paramilitary force in the global south with some 10,000 to 12,000 men. There is a long-running relationship between the Colombian authorities and Israel that continues to this day in terms of the supply of arms and training of the Colombian paramilitaries. Israeli armed dealers have a long-established presence in Colombia's neighbours, Panama and Guatemala. One such arms dealer is Gersa, an Israeli company associated with the Israeli Defence Forces and based in Guatemala. In El Salvador, Israel was funding the death squads that were murdering activists who were resisting the dictatorship. From 1975 to 1979, death squads were 83% armed with Israeli weapons, including helicopters, army trucks, guns, rifles and ammunition. Leading figures in these death squads sent their children to Israel during the civil war so that they could be safe. This civil war was between the right-wing landowning class, supported by a particularly violent military pitted against left wing popular organisations. The Israelis were present from the beginning. Besides arms sales, they helped train ANSESAL, or the National Security Agency of El Salvador. This was the secret police that would later form ORDEN, or the National Democratic Organisation, which would lead to the framework of the infamous death squads that would kill tens of thousands of mainly civilian activists. <laughs> 
By 1981, many of those in the civilian popular political movements who had survived the death squads headed for the hills to become guerrillas. By 1981, there was an open civil war in El Salvador which took over a decade to resolve through negotiations. Even though the US was openly backing the Salvadorian army by 1981, as late as November 1983, it was asking for more Israeli practical assistance over there. The assistance requested was helicopters, trucks, rifles, ammunition and combat infantry advisors to work at both the company and battalion level of the Salvadorian army. One notable Salvadorian officer trained by the Israelis was Major Roberto Dembuison, who always held a high opinion of the Israelis. It was this man who ordered the assassination of El Salvador's Archbishop Oscar Romero, among thousands of other murders. Later, he would organise the right-wing National Republican Alliance Party, ARENA, and sent his son to study abroad in the relative safety of Israel. Amazingly, while the Israelis were trained Training the El Salvadorian death squads, they were also supporting the anti-Semitic Argentine military government of the late 1970s and early 1980s, at a time that the government was involved in another dirty war of death squads and disappearances. The CIA-backed dictator Augusto Pinochet overthrew Salvador Allende's democratically elected government. The following day, Pinochet began creating concentration camps, filling the camps with anyone who they felt were left-wing. These camps were run by Pinochet's secret police, Dina, who were also armed and trained by Israel. Over the decades of Pinochet's reign, Israel armed the genocidal regime. It is also arming police repression in Chile today, as well as all over South America. The Israeli government and the Chilean government have signed military cooperation initiatives. These form part of the repression of the indigenous Mapuche people in Chile. Other parts of the world where Israel has influenced in a similar manner include arming the apartheid government of South Africa and helping them to create nuclear weapons. While governments around the world were boycotting the South African government, Israel supported them and opposed such boycotts. Israel also supplied arms to the Hutus, who murdered over one million Tutsis in the infamous Rwandan genocide of 1994. Israel tried to conceal all arms shipments to Rwanda, fearing prosecution. And of course, Ireland is not exempt from such influence from the Zionist entity. Over the past six years, Israeli Defence Forces military personnel have trained in the Irish Military College. IDF members were among personnel from 13 different countries to attend courses in the college, including the US, Saudi Arabia and Germany. These IDF members attended the college at some point between 2018 and the present day. Israeli military members also received training in Ireland before 2018. Between 2011 and 2014, an IDF member attended an explosive device disposal course at the military academy. In 2001, Israelis also attended training courses at the Defence Forces Training School, according to Dahl Records. This information confirms everything that has been said regarding Ireland being a semi-colony of international capital. This is the material reality. It doesn't matter how hard you vote, the imperialists will use this country in the name of foreign capital, even though we do have native capitalism in this country, most notably agriculture and tourism, with some native companies in the pharmaceutical industries. This native capitalism always serves capitalism abroad. One example of such a business in the agriculture industry is Kerry Group, which has multi-billion dollar investments in the US and China, in addition to its own investments here in Ireland. All profits extracted in this country, as well as state resources, are exported at pace to not only the Western imperialist bloc of the US, EU or Britain and its Commonwealth, but also to countries in the Eastern imperialist bloc, such as China, Brazil and Afar. That's the way things have been, particularly in the Southern State, which is a semi-colony. The North is a full-on colony, with companies in the arms and aerospace industries directly supporting Israel. Elbit System in particular has two offices in Belfast and that's not the only company that has premises up there. Having examined all of this, it can be clearly seen that the Western Imperial Core is complicit with the US in supporting the Zionist entity in maintaining its interest in the Middle East. This Imperial Core exerts control over smaller countries that must fall in line or face the consequences, as Yemen knows all too well. This phenomenon has spread to the ruling classes of Arab countries, which have done very little to nothing to help the Palestinian people, again with the exception 
faction of the Houthi rebels in Yemen who have exhibited true proletarian solidarity. In the words of Leila Khaled, the Arab ruling classes would prefer to embrace Zionism, live under the yoke of American imperialism and delay the historical evolution of their societies rather than submit to the will of the masses, abdicate power or let other forces of progress direct the revolution. Now that we have established that Zionism has well and truly enveloped itself into the fascism that was brewing between the US and Nazi Germany since World War II, we must now take a look at how this fascism manifests itself in the Western ISA or intellectual state apparatus. In Western media, both conventional and social, this new form of Zionist fascism is proliferated, increasingly at pace as time goes on. As part of this proliferation, the Holocaust committed by Nazi Germany, both through the media and the education system, is used as a club to beat any opposition to what happens to Palestinians in occupied Palestine, as Norman Finkelstein points out in this famous clip. The irony is that the Nazi Holocaust has now become the main ideological weapon for launching wars of aggression. Every time you want to launch a war of aggression, drag in the Nazi Holocaust. It's the suffering then used as another pretext or excuse to humiliate, degrade, and torture the Palestinians. That's the problem. The suffering comes as a package. It then comes, here is the suffering, now we blow up your house. Here is the suffering, now we take your land. Here is the suffering, now we drop artillery shells or shoot artillery shells at your villages. It's a package deal with Israel and its American supporters. It's not just suffering, it's suffering which is then wrapped in a club. And the club is then used to break the skulls of the Palestinians. That's the problem. It's not being used to educate people. It's not being used to enlighten people. It's not being used to make people more moral. It can be. But it's not. I mean. It's not. That's the whole point. Of course it can be, but it isn't. It's the best thing that will ever happen to Israel if they get rid of these American Jews who are warmongers from Martha's Vineyard. And they're warmongers from the Hamptons. And they're warmongers from Beverly Hills. And they're warmongers from Miami. It's been a disaster for Israel. You know, it's the best thing if they can ever get rid of this American jury. It's a curse. You guys may recognize Norman from this infamous clip. During your speech, you made a lot of references to Jewish people, as well as certain people in your audience, not Jewish people in general, but certain people, especially in your audience, to Nazis. Now, that is extremely offensive when certain people are German, and they're also extremely offensive to people who have actually suffered under Nazi rule. I don't respect that anymore. I really don't. I don't like and I don't respect the crocodile tears to, to, to the crocodile here. No. Uh, and so, folks, um, allow me to finish. And allow me to allow me to finish. Listen, sirs. Allow me to finish. Allow me to finish. Uh, sir, sir. I don't like to play. I don't like to play before an audience the Holocaust card. But since now I feel com now I feel compelled to, my late father was in Auschwitz. My late mother, please shut up. My late father was in Auschwitz. My late mother was in my Donald concentration camp. Every single member of my family. On my father's side, on my father's side, the Jews did not take arms against the my Germans. My late father was in Auschwitz concentration camp. My late mother was in Maidani concentration camp. Every single member of my family on both sides was exterminated. Both of my parents were in the Warsaw Ghetto Uprising. And it's precisely and exactly 
because of the lessons my parents taught me and my two siblings that I will not be silent when Israel commits its crimes against the Palestinians. And I consider nothing more despicable than to use their suffering and their martyrdom to try to justify the torture, the brutalization, the dem demolition of homes that Israel daily commits against the Palestinians. So I refuse any longer to be intimidated or browbeaten by the tears. If you had any heart in you, you would be crying for the Palestinians, not for what you done. Why? Can I just come the audience in? I've never been in a crowd like this. They're nuts. Please, this, this, I think it's pretty audacious when people try to play the Holocaust card with me. I think that's pretty nervy. What percent of the audience was opposed to me? About a quarter or a fifth? A quarter. The girl in the dark t-shirt who was yelling about the anti-Semitism throughout the thing, she began to yell, uh, well, they're probably turning over in their graves right now. Sorry, my parents were alive throughout most of my struggle, and they totally supported me. That one won't work. It's not like I did about face in 1995 when my parents passed away. I've been doing this since 1982. They heard every word. I never heard an objection. In this next clip, he dives even further into how the Holocaust is shamelessly flaunted in order to dispel criticism in what he calls the Holocaust industry. I was wondering if you could tell us what the Holocaust industry is. Basically, it's the exploitation of the colossal suffering of Jews during World War II for political and then for a certain period financial gain. The political gain was basically using the Nazi Holocaust as a club to silence criticism of Israel. And at some point, this Holocaust compensation racket, the extraction of monies from European governments in the name of what were called needy Holocaust victims began and several, I think that the figure comes now to about $20 billion were um, coerced from European governments, mostly on fraudulent grounds. And then there was all of this schlock nonsense, uh, which basically is used to defend Israel and deflect criticism of Israeli policy. Uh, in, you can usually tell this literature because it's, uh, it, it asserts or insists on the absolute uniqueness of the Nazi Holocaust the claim that no people in the history of, in the history of humanity have ever suffered the way Jews suffered. And that's clearly an ideological claim. You can't intellectually prove things like that. And it's almost absurd to want to prove them. Uh, the purpose is fairly straightforward. That is, if people have uniquely suffered then they can't be held to conventional moral and legal standards. So, for example, if you say that Israel tortures Palestinian detainees, well, then you're told, remember the Holocaust. Or if you're told that Israel illegally demolishes the homes of Palestinians, you're told, remember the Holocaust. The point being that because Jews suffered uniquely, it somehow excuses these by any other standard, crimes. In the new age of reaction that has been displayed in the media in recent years, both conventional and social, characters such as Ben Shapiro and Elon Musk proliferate the Zionist line against Muslims. 
Ben Shapiro, who we can safely say is a Zionist Nazi, openly supports the mistreatment and eradication of Palestinians and considers them to be subhuman. He even made fun of Rachel Corrie, an American pro-Palestinian activist who was run over by an Israeli bulldozer in 2003. Shapiro's vicious sentiments towards Palestinians were exposed in the infamous Andrew Neil interview. I think trying to I've point said. out some of the things you, you've said that seem to me to help to stoke that anger. For example, you said sure. Israelis like to build, Arabs like to bomb crap and live in open sewage. Well, as I say in an article entitled, here's a list of all the giant bad dumb things I've ever said. Was that, that, was that includes, dumb? What? Yes, that's a dumb tweet. And not only, but it is also important to mention that the next few tweets clarify that that tweet is specifically referring to the Hamas leadership, which, no. by the way, a BBC I've, I've seen is relatively reticent no. to condemn. No, actually, it wasn't what you went on to do and say, uh, you are correct about the slur and our Arabs. It's not all Arabs that want to live in open sewage and blow things up. It's just Palestinians, you went on to say. No, it's, a, no, it's, and, a, no, and it's just the said, ones who take sides against Israel the Israel, and the Israel-Palestinian conflict. The population is rotten to the core, you went on to say. Not Hamas, I say by, the yeah, Palestinian I say by pull, uh, Arab population. He has written many subpar articles on his Daily Wire website, which is boosted by favourable social media algorithms. Facebook, in particular, has been known to have a cosy relationship with billionaire-funded conservative outlets in the US. One example of such billionaires are the Koch brothers, who made their fortune selling their fracking business to a consortium of investment funds. They provided the seed money to set up both PragerU and the Daily Wire, the latter of which enjoys particularly high viewing numbers from Facebook. Shapiro was also alleged to have been in contact with Mossad, since his days working for Breitbart.com by a former co-worker at the website. In the other corner, we have Elon Musk, an explicit anti-Semite and Islamophobic racist. He constantly posts and promotes such racism in his tweets, and has also reinstated and retweeted posts from Nazis who focus on these groups. For example, Elon Musk has reinstated the accounts of far-right Zionist fascists like Tommy Robinson, who openly supports Soldier F, the last remaining soldier from Bloody Sunday in Derry, who is still alive at the time of recording. Despite showing such racism and blatant disregard for other people's human rights, both Elon Musk and Ben Shapiro had attended the Holocaust Memorial at Auschwitz as part of this Holocaust industry that Norman Finkelstein spoke about in the clip earlier. Even the NATO Twitter account which has absorbed several high-profile Nazis into its leadership, has been celebrating Holocaust Memorial Day as well. This almost religious reverence for what happened during the Holocaust, completely ignoring the fact that it was the Red Army who freed the vast majority of prisoners from the camps in World War II, is one example of a false history that is often used by reactionaries to proliferate their beliefs, and more importantly, their actions. And this has clearly shown in the Western ISA, as we have just discussed. <laughs> As we discussed at the beginning of the video, fascism at its core has always embodied a single racial or national identity that intentionally sidesteps the ultimate contradiction in modern capitalist society, that is, the contradiction between capital and labour. It not only encourages but actively enforces class collaborationism in order to maintain the fascist entity. This is seen not only in Israel and the US but also in many countries around the world as you may have seen from this guy up on your screen. In order to maintain itself, it must consume more and more of its scapegoats and oppress more and more people until proletarian revolution rises up and crushes it. In order to do that, it needs to spread its ideals to more and more people so that it produces more oppressors and scapegoats, which is done through the intellectual state apparatus of the affected country or region. This is mainly within the conservative sphere online, with the likes of Ben Shapiro and Elon Musk profiting greatly from spreading such ideas. Fascism cannot exist on ideas alone, however. It must arm and train militias in order to keep the oppression going. However, due to the ideals upon which fascism is based not being rooted in reality, 
By this we mean they base their ideals upon a false history and national identity, which isolates the basic rights to those who fit within that national identity at the expense of the scapegoats. Once the working classes challenge these militias, they are often found to be paper tigers. In the words of Mao Zedong, I have said that all the reputedly powerful reactionaries are merely paper tigers. The reason is that they are divorced from the people. Look, was not Hitler a paper tiger? Was Hitler not overthrown. I also said that the Tsar of Russia, the Emperor of China and Japanese imperialism were all paper tigers. As we know, they were all overthrown. US imperialism has not yet been overthrown and it has the atom bomb. I believe it also will be overthrown. It too is a paper tiger. With special thanks to Turning Earth Podcast, Ruben Guinan and James Connolly Stipend Fund. If you want to get your name on the screen, check out the Patreon in the link below. All small contributions really help to grow and develop the channel. Thank you guys so much. Garav me la and I'll see you next time. Mm-hmm.